This is a presentation. Dushan Bielich is going to pre present uh, most of it and uh, demonstrate with this apparatus here. Um, I'll do a few things for a few minutes in the beginning. Um, I'll start by talking about uh, the later Garfinkel. Uh, he's also the late Garfinkel. But um, as with Wittgenstein, there remains questions about whether there is a distinct break between the earlier and later phases of Garfinkel's career. It's less dramatic for Garfinkel than for Wittgenstein, as by far he's best known for one publication, which is Studies in Ethnomethodology, uh, which was quite radical in its break from sociology of the day. Uh, Garfinkel did not publish a tractatus or anything equivalent to that, uh, which would stand in contrast to studies. Uh, but he, in, earlier in his life, he worked with Talcott Parsons and uh, wrote a dissertation under Parsons' direction, which was an explicitly theoretical project, and so studies did contrast somewhat to that. Um, Anne Rawls' introduction to Garfinkel's program, the 2002 publication of papers written at various times, uh, emphasizes the continuities in Garfinkel's biography, dating back to the 1930s, uh, when he was just starting to be a student. And others have argued that noticeable seeds of ethnomethodology can be found in Garfinkel's early essay, uh, Color Trouble, a quasi-fictional account of uh, a hostile encounter, racial encounter on a bus, um, and in his early papers on homicide trials in the 1940s. <coughs> Related to this are efforts to place Garfinkel in the classic sociology tradition, and he arguably complied to an extent uh, in uh, his uh, subtitle of Working Out uh, uh, Durkheim's Ar Aphorism. It's not my interest to engage in a scholarly debate about Garfinkel's early writings and the relationship to what he later wrote under the rubric of ethnomethodology, though I am skeptical of any effort to use the documentary method to establish thematic and biographical continuities, and I guess the same would apply to discontinuities. I think studies itself represented a break from his earlier work because taking him at his, at his word, or at least some of his words, Garfinkel made a further break from studies in the decades afterwards. Some of the chapters and studies represent a gestalt switch from conducting conventional methods in studies, uh, quantitative studies, observational studies, uh, where he turns attention from the subject of the study, which would be a clinic and nursing staff practices and processes, uh, or uh, uh, the uh, coded um, uh, events found on tape recordings to the uh, practices, uh, the ad hoc practices employed by his research assistants and the uh, uh, good organizational reasons for uh, the clinic records which turned out to be methodologically inadequate in the clinic study. Less obviously, following the publication of studies in ethnomethodology, Garfinkel emphasized some novel developments that if they were not incommensurable with what he did in studies, introduced quite different lines of research. And he uh, did suggest that there was something of a break. Uh, I don't think he articulated it as a matter of incommensurability or anything that uh, was quite so dramatic, but he saw some key differences in his later work. At the time when he wrote the chapters and studies, uh, conversational and that conversation analysis either was not yet or was barely underway. The 1970 paper with Sachs marked a transition um, as it picked up the theme of indexicality, which of course was uh, prominent in studies, and developed further in relation to the sorts of recorded interactions that Sachs was investigating by 1970. The rapid establishment of CA in the 1970s, especially with the 1974 turn-taking paper, provided both an exemplar and a challenge for Garfinkel, as CA seemed to owe little to phenomenology and deployed a version of rules and structure that was potentially at odds with Garfinkel's picture. Even before Sachs died in 1975, Garfinkel was aiming to devise an alternative conception of the temporality of conversation, um, but nevertheless, when pressed to disavow the empiricism in CA, he refused to do so, and on one occasion, I recall, in the 1970s, he defended his refusal by citing the fecundity of the field, alluding to mushrooms that were popping up all, all over in CA, or the publications, the excitement it generated, and he wanted to let that go, even though people like uh, 
I think it was uh, Peter McHugh asking him questions at the time, uh, raised sort of epistemological problems with it. Um, Garfinkel's program of studies of work, while continuous with some of the chapters and studies, also introduced some novel conceptual turns and terms. Perhaps the most striking of these was unique adequacy. Uh, he, and he also downgraded ethnography, or what he called analytic ethnography, as he, uh, at, at one time, in favor of a different kind of inquiry. In his writings and lectures in the, in the 70s and 80s, he re referenced ideas, themes, and initiatives he attributed to Sachs, David Sudno, and Eric Livingston that differed from his own and others of his students' ethnographies at the time and earlier. He credited Sachs with an insight that he, Garfinkel, named perspicuous phenomena, that is, uh, ob observed, organized phenomena that, uh, or occasions that uh, show uh, or highlight particular attention to matters of standing interest in uh, ethnomethodology and other subjects. David Sudno's ways of the hand, within, uh, he credited with insight into the embodied production of work, and he credited Livingston with the importance of uniquely adequate investigations. He even wrote a squib, uh, never published and never will be published, called What's So Good About the Bielich and Lynch Paper, referring to a study that Dushin, who's co-presenting with me, and I wrote on Goethe's refutation of Newton's optics, a paper that strongly advised readers to engage with its visual materials with a prism in hand, and we gave instructions on where to find a prism. Unique adequacy was a methodological requirement that in part invited the ethnographer or uh, investigator to commit the cardinal sin of going native, that is to largely abandon the methodological strictures of sociology or anthropology in favor of the conceptions of practice, reasoning, rationality, and the rest that were endogenous to the fields of practice studied. There were further aspects to it, though, that had to do with de demonstration and demonstrability. Instead of writing about a profession's work uh, or an organized activity such as playing improvisational jazz, a structured activity such as providing a theorem or working out a mathematics problem or playing a game, the aim was to bring the reader into the field so that the reader, if only in an elementary way, would participate in the actual activity. This was not applied ethnomethodology uh, since it remained unclear what was to be applied in the particular settings. Indeed, Garfinkel described these studies as or these settings as tutorial settings, settings that provide tutorials for the investigator and instructions on the themes of initial interest. In a reference to Sudno's Ways of the Hand, Garf Garfinkel gave qualified praise to the way Sudno described and depicted his engagement with the keyboard and developed a pedagogy that progressed from elementary exercises to a fluency with what he called singing with the fingers at the keys to produce and improvise with the characteristic sounds of jazz. The praise was qualified by mention of the fact that Sudno did not describe what he initially set out to do, which was to describe the way members of a jazz ensemble and demonstrate coordinate their playing together. Not incidentally, Sudno abandoned his tenured position at UC Irvine and developed his own pedagogy of playing music with mixed success. In many of his published and unpublished writings in the late 1970s and afterwards, Garfinkel praised Eric Livingston's study of mathematics and insisted that the study was not only a contribution to ethnomethodology, but that it contributed, it contributed as well to mathematics. And he envisioned an array of hybrid studies of ethnomethodology with other activities. Garfinkel himself, in a chapter of his 2002 book, describes an effort to perform a version of Galileo's demonstration with the inclined plane. This approach raises some vexing questions, which I hope we'll have a chance to discuss. But before proceeding to, to these questions, Dushin will do some demonstration that both of us have used in seminars before, and he's very adept at. Um, and he's also written about uh, in his book on Galileo's pendulum. Eric Livingston also has written uh, a piece that uh, is critical of the way Dushin has uh, presented it, and I can give you references to these if you're interested. 
Um, <clears throat> the word, uh, the final word, is about part of the title, reflexivity, um, and uh, this conference theme of radical ethnomethodology you may recall an article that Melvin Palner wrote in the early 1990s uh, entitled Left of Ethnomethodology, in, in which he was uh, arguing uh, that conversation analysis and Garfinkel's studies of left work had sort of left the field of ethnomethodology as it existed before and also was uh, moving away from the left in a kind of, not, not politically necessarily, but in, in terms of radicalism. And uh, Palmer argued that what was being left behind was uh, uh, radical reflexivity, as he called it. Uh, by Palmer's lights, the pursuit of what he called endogenous reflexivity led to the abandonment of radical reflexivity. Uh, not necessarily, but as a matter of uh, history in ethnomethodology, it did that. The, uh, the position I take on this matter is that so-called endogenous re reflexivity holds very radical implications. Performing an organized practice, even something seemingly as simple as trying to achieve the synchronicity of three pendulums string swung on a, a frame, provides a different and rich field of, for thinking about and analytically addressing the organization of a practice, and is one of the most, and it is one that is much different from understandings of themes of, for example, scientific observation or the mathematization of nature that one gains from erudite writings such as Husserl's Crisis. It's a matter of getting it in an entirely different way uh, from the more cognitivist versions of self-reflection. And uh, with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to, literally, uh, Dushin to perform his exercise. All right, um, I'll, I'll make a little introduction just to clarify uh, what I uh, will be demonstrating here. I mean, uh, Mike uh, has given uh, to you a um, general overview, and where I fit into this context is that <clears throat> once I read Garfinkel's um, uh, account of Galileo's inclined plane, I was interested to find for myself what does that mean? And then I chose a simple um, Galileo's pendulum uh, to um, provide some accounts of uh, um, things that Garfinkel was uh, investigating and discovering in, in the inclined plane. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, two things is that um, <clears throat> What I understand at a radical ethnomethodological phenomena to be is one that fulfills two principles. One is that order is at any point. Therefore, uh, order has to be in this thing called Galileo's pendulum. And it is in two ways order there. One as an ordinary instrument, but the other one as a point in which Galileo himself found the order of heavens in these simple things. Um, <clears throat> and the other one is the um, unique adequacy requirement, which uh, I understand to be that, uh, that the, uh, the, the account of the thing has to be equivalent to the method of its investigation. So to the question, what is a thing, uh, can be answered adequately only by way in which you investigate this, or what sort of uh, accounts do you um, uh, you can provide in uh, using the thing and discovering all kinds of contingencies that are discoverable only if you engage yourself in relationship to this thing. Now, these two principles uh, don't mean the same to every ethnomethodologist. We have to understand that, at least in my view, there are three schools in ethnomethodology. One is uh, um, a school uh, that uh, originated here in University of Manchester, uh, which, I will call, which I will say or name it as a school that looks 
for uh, conceptual clarification of the things pertaining to practical life. Then there's the CA, which looks at, um, uh, at the transcript as a domain of what is to be analyzed and how far analysis can go. And the third one is what I will call uh, Garfink uh, Garfinkel's ethnomethodology, uh, which is a different <clears throat> because it has a different inspiration behind uh, its uh, research uh, that belongs to the philosophy of uh, Husserl, uh, Merleau-Ponty, and, and Heidegger. Uh, and therefore, uh, there, uh, the ethnological approach of that kind put more emphasis on a physiognomy of thing, on sensual account of thing, uh, not as much as in conceptual clarity of things. So sometimes, uh, in order for something to be uh, explained, had to remain ambiguous, uh, and uh, something that cannot be fully incorporated in account as, as what stands for uh, this coverable uh, domain. So, uh, <clears throat> as I uh, listed here, before I uh, demonstrate how, uh, uh, what Galileo Pendulum is, I would like to first clarify some of its, what we'll call discursive inventory, historical, philosophical, and sociological. Historical <clears throat> is that Galileo Pendulum is unique uh, structure, practical structure, that never existed before, or use of a pendulum never existed before Galileo. Pendulum was used for entertainment, or people used to find a water uh, underground, but to use a pendulum to question our presupposition about heavens, and relation between the stars and the planet and all, all of that, was unique. Uh, unique uh, way of thinking about things. And so the structure uh, of, of, um, of pendulum was built in a way uh, to reflect those concerns. How we can understand heavens by looking at uh, pendulum and its uh, phenomena. The other aspect of, of this historical inventory that most of Galileo's demonstrations, we have to understand, were not <coughs> produced for scientific community, because there were no scientific community at that time. Uh, Galileo was invited uh, when he was in, in, um, in Venice and Padua by, in Florence by Med Medici's court, because Medici's court wanted to promote rational or natural uh, philosophy at that time uh, in relationship to po Pope and, and Catholicism. And therefore, Galileo, as, as a leading natural philosopher, was politically suited to Medici's court. And there was a disymbiosis between political and uh, philosophical within the court setup is that all those demonstrations were produced to show not only rationality of a uh, natural world, but also as an entertainment, because the audience was a court nobility that, uh, uh, for the most part, uh, were uh, in a court to be entertained. So he, in order to convey rationality of thinking, he had to invent um, uh, demonstrations that are also entertaining and kind of mir uh, miraculous uh, in a certain way uh, to convey uh, his, uh, his point. So in that sense, uh, pendulum has this, this element of a public spectacle. <clears throat> um, philosophical uh, inventory of uh, Galileo's pendulum, as we know, uh, Thomas Kuhn um, um, argued that pendulum was an instrument that introduced a paradigmatic shift um, and that uh, the argument or the demonstrations that motion is a function of time rather than of space and weight actually change our understanding of things in which we cannot rely anymore on our sense experience uh, and we must use mathematics in order to actually see how things actually work. So there's this um, element of, um, if you will, deconstruction of our perception uh, that was a part of the uh, function of, uh, of uh, pendulum. 
Then there is a philosophical issue <clears throat> with Galilean science. Uh, they, they were raised by Husserl, who argued that, uh, Gar uh, that uh, Galileo, or the, a feature of, uh, of Galilean discoveries is that while he was a great discoverer, he was also a great concealer. That is to say that every discovery that he made concealed layers of what he called Lebenswelt, uh, or those uh, properties that don't belong to the formal structure of formal knowledge that had to do with a certain kind of physical uh, um, um, uh, uh, structural setup, like in, 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 in a laboratory, uh, in, you know, body relationship to, uh, to uh, instruments and so on and so forth. They're not part of a formal structure, but are infrastructural component in um, uh, producing uh, discoveries. Then there's a Heidegger who um, uh, argue, who went further than, than Husserl to argue that basically all of these instruments don't tell us uh, anything about nature. Uh, they're telling us about their own internal uh, work. That is to say that if you put instruments, if you construct this artificial setup, uh, all that you're going to learn is about what, what uh, pertains to those instruments but nature remains completely uh, absent from it. Uh, because nature, as Aristotelians argue, can be understood only through uh, metaphysical reflection and not through construction or forcing nature to speak to us. Um, <clears throat> and then there's the Merleau-Ponty uh, that was relevant for, uh, for, for um, Garfinkel as well as for this inventory is that we have to uh, understand things and instruments as something that is an extension of our body and our use. Uh, as um, Heidegger asked, well, what is a thing? Uh, uh, to which he answered, well, thing is its use. In other words, things are not out there as the Kantian objects in themselves, but they are basically uh, uh, set up around us as uh, tools which we use uh, uh, in a ways that um, uh, we made them to be used or we invent uses, new uses, and so on and so forth. So in that sense, uh, bodily relationship to the instrument is a relevant component in understanding how to approach to studying uh, a thing or that, in this case, this specific thing, uh, Galileo's pendulum. And sociological uh, relevances of this is, um, <clears throat> pertains to the question of understanding or uh, Weberian Verstehen. As we know, Weber invented this concept to explain how is uh, a social world produced on the level of uh, individual meaning. And as, he, as you probably know, you know Calvinist uh, takes into account his uh, or her set of beliefs and then acts according to those beliefs. Schutz then comes and says, well, actually, there's a difference between the rationality of a sociologist and an actor's, and therefore, you have to focus on the rationality of action versus a rationality of reflection in order to understand what actually people are doing. And this is where, where Garfinkel comes and says, well, if you really want to address the issue of understanding, Right? that is something that pertains to practice, then you have to demonstrate that you actually understand this practice, which is the way of what we call instructive respecification, that you can do something and then you can teach how this is being done in a way that the other can reproduce its appearance as it is being claimed to be um, uh, made of, so to say. So in that sense, uh, understanding is a demonstrable um, uh, and achievable uh, property. So now I would like to move to, uh, to the pendulum itself. So there's a f we, we might say there's a formal structure to the pendulum, and then there is a, uh, a dynamic structure uh, to this pendulum. Formal structure of the pendulum consists of several components. One is that every pendulum has to have a fixed point of rest. Then it has its own length. And this length is relevant because it is the length that generates perception of different motion. So uh, if you take this length and this length, you will see 
that they produce visually two different speeds. But in reality, uh, they are moving with the same speed. The reason why they look differently because they're passing different length. And then there is the weight. So the weight is this, which actually uh, uh, is um, uh, uh, one that generates the motion because uh, it is uh, object that is um, um, attracted by the gravity force, although at that time Galileo was not aware of it. So the way that he accounted for this uh, 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 force is in the motion of, uh, of the pendulum itself. So um, <clears throat> now that we have this, this formal structure, uh, Galileo then <clears throat> moves to show how motion of things are congruent with mathematical uh, rules. And the reason why he was doing that because uh, uh, two things. One is that our perception is deceiving and the truth is in mathematics. As he argued, the God uh, mathematics is a language of God, and therefore, if we really want to know what is behind the things, we have to find mathematical grounding. And that is the beginning of the use of mathematics in physics, because before Galileo, mathematics was perceived only as a kind of abstract, uh, uh, self-contained form of thinking, sort of like music, and had no application to physical world because it's a pure abstraction. Um, so <clears throat> there's a, a, a several laws that uh, that pertain to uh, to the pendulum. One of which is what he called um, uh, law of uh, um, equal motion time. That is to say that every pendulum, regardless of its length and its weight, moves all, uh, in equal times. Uh, and that, that is uh, a unique properties of the pendulum uh, that then, when you put them together, show us um, perception that actually they are moving with a different speed, when in fact it's the same time. It's just the length is which defines how we're going to perceive these things. Um, so to show that actually uh, uh, motion is, is in a free fall is not defined by weight or by distance, but by this constant uh, uh, speed. Uh, he invented uh, several demonstrations, which he supported by uh, uh, mathematical demonstration. So here <clears throat> we have a circle and these uh, three lines which are supposed to show three different ways of releasing a uh, uh, body uh, falling down. So you have two bodies falling down on the inclined plane and one uh, falling straight. Now if three bodies are released at the same time, they're going to touch uh, the ground in three different times. Uh, here will uh, um, be the first fall, second and third. But he argues that actually <clears throat> this is a this does not mean that motion is not uniform. Uh, that is to say, the free fall is, is, has a, a uniform uh, uh, speed. That if you look in the uh, uh, structure of uh, uh, geometric structure, you will see a certain relationship, which will then uh, demonstrate and prove the equal time uh, fall, which is that this AD uh, line. It's a mean to A, E, A, B, and A, F, A, C. And because of their uh, relationship, uh, that the uh, fall of object from A to E, A to F, and A to D, if released in the same time, they will touch those points in, in the same time. Which also means that if you release the pendulum from this uh, angle or this angle, they are going to uh, touch the, the, the point here at the same time if you release the object uh, from, from the top. And so here he will <clears throat> use 
a pendulum or two pendulum with um, let's say here we have a two pendulum of a different weight you have a metal one and there is a wooden one now our common sense thinking is that if I take let's say if I take a um, piece of paper and if I take this ball and I ask you which one is going to touch the ground first? Well, you will say lead, right? Is that true? Yeah, it is true. So why would you argue that this is not uh, true, that you're actually misperceiving things? Well, think about this. If we do this, if I put lead here and, and on the paper and see what's going to happen then, well, then they fall at the same time. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is not in a weight of thing. It is in air resistance. So different things are resisting to, uh, to air, and therefore it's unequal time of the fall. Uh, and this is an important argument because Aristotelians believe that objects fall in the same speed that is defined by their weight. So heavy objects fall fast and light objects falling down uh, slower. And Galileo saying, no, they are all uh, falling down with the same uh, speed of acceleration. And to show that, he says, OK, well, let's see here. We have a heavy object and a light object. And see uh, when they are released, if they're going to hit the ground at the same time. Does it? Well, you have to kind of here listen. Is that a synchrony of touch? Sort of, right? Which is a part of the, of the whole thing is that, you know, you have to see things, but you cannot see it as clearly. But you have to rely on sen uh, a sense perception, on the sound, uh, uh, because Galileo relied very much on the synchrony of things because he has a good musical ear and because there was no uh, mechanical time to measure things, you have to rely on some sense of rhythm and on the sense of temporal order in, in the sound, like uh, chanting or, uh, or um, <clears throat> singing uh, 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 lines that are of the same length. Uh, that can serve you as a standard of a uh, temporal motion. So then uh, if we take a distance as a factor, let's say the heavy object is the closer and lighter is further away. So it looks like that even if you take a paper here and a lead ball there, and if you don't have air, they're going to touch the ground at the same time. That weight and the distance are not relevant. Right? So here is all of these uh, perceptions are challenging our common sense, uh, common sense um, understanding of things, which is pretty much based on, okay, let me just take this one in which lighter is closer and this one is further away. So So here is, he has created uh, uh, conditions in which air resistance is minimized, which then allow him to provide the motion to fit his, uh, his mathematical claim, right? That because in geometric relationships are here, that is to say that these lines are uh, geometrically related in, in a... a uh, the, the, the they said in, in uh, uh, geometrical uh, rational order in such a way that the motion is going along this line to be, to be the same. So here you have mathematical and physical conforming at the same time. Then he had show also that the, if you drop the ball from the top of the circle down, which would be in this way, let's say, if this is a... Uh, half of a circle, and if this is a full circle, then 
we will have to have a same moment of fall if we release them at the same time. So this is a little bit difficult, but I'll try to do my, my best. So I say, so in other words, I'm going to release this one and this one, they will have to touch the base at the same time. That, of course, that didn't work. Close. Okay. So it looks like that is also, uh, let me say, a congruence between the visible and and uh, geometrical. The other example they want to use here is <clears throat> uh, a tree pendulum that he suggested uh, that there was no historic document whether he ever used it or not, but he intuitively predicted that if you take three pendulum which, uh, which uh, are in a ratio of uh, four units, nine units to 16 units, and if you release them at the same time, you're going to have an interesting phenomena, uh, and that is that they're going to, while having a different uh, order of swings, there are going to be a time when they're going to swing together uh, for a one full swing. And the, re and the reason behind this is that what Galileo says <clears throat> is that, uh, uh, you see, the, the, the time of a pendulum, that is to say time of the swing, you couldn't at that time define by mechanical time as we do today, let's say, uh, uh, so many seconds, because seconds were not known. So the, pendu the time was, was determined only in relationship to other motion. Right? So you have to have relational uh, uh, component in order to measure time. And so every length you know, has a, a square of time in relationship to other length. And if you take that into account, if you have a, a, a three pendulum of this length, four, nine, and six, you have an interesting phenomena that if, uh, if a length has a, uh, uh, its time square, then the time is a square root of its length, which means that if lengths are four, you have a two swings in relationship to three swings in relationship to uh, four swings. But in this case, the order will be reversal, which is to say that when this shorter one makes four swings, the longest one makes two swings, and the middle one makes three swings, they're going to swing in one full swing together, and then after that they're going to go uh, 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 apart. And after the same motion, they will come back in a rhythmical motion. So I will try to demonstrate this. <clears throat> And it will take me a little bit of time because you have to release them at the same time. Okay. Now, this is not very visible because this is not released in the right uh, way, but you can see these two motions really moving together now. Now, okay, so let me try this way. Let's go one, let's say this two first. Now, now, now. Right? So let's see the shorter one and the long one. Okay, this is not good. I have to release. Anybody see synchrony? Two? I don't, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you do. Let me try on with that. Three. Maybe I can do something like this.
well, doesn't want to cooperate today. I can't, I can't do it. Okay. Now. Now. So, a couple of things. One is the phenomena doesn't stay for a long time. It stays as long as you can successfully produce it, right? So there's a relation between the skills and, and the uh, av availability of seeing it. Now we can see here how that changes the motion. Uh, <clears throat> uh, secondly, the question is like, how is possible to have a tree pendulum of a different length that are moving with a different uh, 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 number of swings to swing together one full swing. So how is possible that three different motions of different time come to the point in which they actually have the same, same time? Right? Um, and so that's the part of the, of the uh, he will say, well, because of geometry of things. Right? It is like a harmony, like how is that a high tone and, and low tone at one point are in harmony. Right? Uh, so th this is the way that, that the um, <clears throat> perceptive is being challenged, but then it is being reconstructed and understood by virtue of, of uh, mathematical um, explanation. Okay, I'll, I'll stop here.